Thanks very much for your welcome. And uh, it's a real privilege to be here with you and a privilege to share in your pre-Easter series on the power of the cross. Um, my wife and I have just got back from a time in South Africa where we've been with a, another uh, part of the New Frontiers family, the Regions Beyond family, and uh, we've just spent four weeks there. So this is uh, great to come back from that and then come straight down here, really. Um, and also one of our, my fellow elders from the Woodside Church in Bedford, Felix Apong, is with, with me. And uh, uh, it's great that we're able to come together to be with you. So I'm going to speak on the power of the cross, the example of Jesus. And uh, it's, I'm sure in your series, different aspects of the power of the cross will be covered. We'll, you'll be hearing about, I don't know, I haven't seen the whole series, but I'm, I'm, I, I assume you'll be fairly uh, evangelical in your presentation of this. And so uh, I'm sure you'll be looking at the uh, power of the cross in terms of the, um, the wrath of God being satisfied by Jesus, the power of redemption, the freedom from sin, the power to defeat the devil. Are those the sort of things in your series? More or less? Okay, I haven't seen the whole series, so I've just got mine. Uh, so, uh, but I'm going to speak on the power of the example to us through the cross. Okay, that's not always stressed as much as the others. And rightly, those other aspects are particularly spoken about, but one aspect of this central symbol of Christianity, the cross of Jesus, sh shows a model for handling relationships in the church, patterns of Christian leadership, and how we deal with less obvious sins, such as status that uh, people want to claim, because that's actually what is being addressed in the scripture that we're going to read. And so I'm going to read actually a longer section than I'll speak about in detail, because I won't be able to have time to speak about it all in detail. But because, the reason I'm doing this is because in literary terms, this would have been one section. The people who originally heard this read out loud because remember, it, would have, it was a letter that wasn't a letter that just sort of people read by themselves. People wouldn't have been able to do that in those days. Rather, it would have been read out loud to the congregation and they would have seen this as one section because of the construction of it. I won't go into the details as to why, but let's just read it together. So I'm going to read from Philippians 1, verse 27 to 2, 18. Okay, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but that you're going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. You ever think of those two as privileges? Privilege of trusting in Christ, but the privilege of also of suffering for him. We're in this struggle together. You've seen my struggle in the past. That's when Paul was there in Philippi. And you know that I'm still in the midst of it. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. 
Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's declare that together now, shall we? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can we say it together? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God of God the Father. So we're declaring it now. Dear friends, you always followed, always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one could criticize you. Leave clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life then. On the day of Christ, then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful servant is an off her service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice. And I will share your joy. Okay, so what's the background to this? Well, Paul was in Rome, in prison. Though he did expect to be out soon. The Philippian church was suffering a bout of increased persecution too. And they'd sent one of their leaders, Epaphroditus, to visit Paul in prison and take him a gift. And Epaphroditus had been sick and nearly died. If Paul had a favourite church, I don't suppose he did really, but the Philippian church was rather like that. It was the only church he allowed to give him a gift for his own ministry. But there was a problem in the church. Two of Paul's co-workers, who were part of the leadership of the church, two women called Euodia and Syntyche, had fallen out. There were disruptions in relationships and a desire for status, which was a prevailing sin in that culture. Now Paul, very wisely, and in good Eastern style, didn't deal with it at the beginning, directly in the early in the letter. He doesn't actually ha handle it directly till the last chapter. But all the way through, he is giving examples of good and bad motives of others. He talks about when he was in prison in Rome, some people were preaching uh, the, uh, the gospel out of a good motive, others were doing out of selfish ambition. What he's doing, he's working round to the problem of relationships in Philippi, amongst the leaders there even, but also amongst the church, because people would have been taking one side or the other, and gets to it indirectly by going through examples of people that were doing, preaching the gospel for a good motive, or others who were preaching it out of selfish ambition. Some, and, uh, and then the greatest example, having talked about that, the greatest example is this wonderful hymn that I read about Jesus and his becoming a servant of others, which is what I'll focus on today. After that, after speaking on Jesus, he talked about two other people, Epaphroditus and Timothy, who are also great examples of uh, serving others rather than putting themselves first. And then he talked about how he himself, Paul, 
follow the examples of Jesus by renouncing all the social advantages he could have claimed regarding it as just rubbish. That's my summary of the letter to the Philippians. Okay, and he's working around to dealing with the issue. And it's good when we're dealing with, uh, with issues, not just to come and speak plainly about them first of all. That's not the biblical method. The biblical method is to speak about truth, the example of Jesus, the example of godly people, and then come down to it. Come on, we've got to learn to agree with one another. And so... This wonderful section about Christ is like other scriptures that draw out the theology of who Christ is. It's a profound piece of writing. When described as a hymn, it's not like sort of a modern song we'll sing, um, like on on, on the PowerPoint earlier, but it's poetic in character and like a creed That is something that Christians all believe in the way it expresses truth. So it does it in poetry, but also it's a statement, this is what we believe about Jesus. And so very, very full. And it fits neatly into the rhetoric of this letter, emphasising the things that Paul wanted from the Philippians. Self-denial, service, Humility and perseverance in sufferings. That's what it's about. That's what the hymn describes Jesus as being. And Paul is saying, come on, this is an example as to how we should live. And then there's two parts to the hymn. Firstly, downward movement from heaven. The movement of the divine one, Jesus the Son, to come and live as a, as, a, as, a, as a man, to serve people and then down to the cross without ever ceasing to be who he was. Um, <laughs> Jesus never ceased to be God, but this hymn says he didn't use that status in order to win the people. He came as a servant, as a slave even is the word. And so it it brings the example of Christ against false models of seeking power which are so prominent in almost every culture. So he became from the form of God, he existed in the form of God, he never stopped being God but took the form of a slave. Christ functioned not according to a coercive power paradigm but took on the role of a slave to save the world. That was the way to save a world full of sin, but also full of status and pride. You know, all the time, the the sin that Paul is driving at here in in Philippi is not the, the obvious sins of sexual immorality or other things that he might deal with in other letters. Rather, it's the one that's much more subtle, that of status, and pride. Okay, we're, people tend to seek that. And so he humbled himself and he chose to refuse to exploit his divine status and power. So the Philippians are to have among themselves the same attitude as Jesus. It is free willed renunciation of his heavenly power and glory. So similarly, we today, in our relationships with one another, in our attitudes to leadership, refuse all all symbols of status and power. We don't do that. Martin Luther, and I hesitate speaking about Martin Luther in the presence of the world's expert on Martin Luther, who happens to be your team leader here. But... He spoke about the difference between the theology of glory and the theology of the cross. And he, the, the, the church up until that time that Martin Luther was uh, objecting to had what he called a theology of glory. 
And you can see that. You can see that in the glorious buildings. You could see that in the wonderful clothes they wore at that time. And he, he talked about that's the theology of glory, whereas actually Christian leadership is to follow the theology of the cross. That is, I'm a servant. I don't take position. I don't take status. I humbly take the position of the cross and serve others and I'm willing to die for my faith. That was the reality of a life in the first century. It's the reality of life for Christians in, most part, in many parts of the world today. And then also in the world today, particularly in the West, there's been a reversion to this theology of glory, position, everything big, that's what makes you, that's makes you, that's what makes you famous, rather than genuine servant leadership and servant, not just leaders, one another serving like Christ did. That's the example. Hence, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Having the mindset of Christ is the way to live the whole of the Christian life. And so Paul is correcting faulty mindsets shaped by false ideas drawn both from Greek, Roman and Jewish life, all of which draw on external status and power, as does every culture. Christian leadership is always countercultural. Yet in my experience, Christian leadership, and it's appropriate talking about that because we're uh, praying for leaders tonight, seems to draw its models from whatever culture the leader is in. It's one, this wonderfully describes Christ, he is in God's form, but emptied himself so as not to exploit his position, but demonstrate God in a different form, that of a servant. Jesus took on the position of servant to humanity and experienced the death of a slave with crucifixion. So, you know, it's not just often the question is asked, why did Jesus die? That's not just a question. This question is, why was he crucified? Why the death of a slave? Why the death of a criminal? Why? Why subject himself to external mockery? It's not just that he died, but that he was crucified. It's hard to find a modern uh, um, examples of this. One African-American theologian wrote a book called The Cross, and the lynching tree, that the closest you could get to the sort of death that Jesus died it was how in, in America, in the southern states, black guys would be just lynched with no trial, everyone gathering around to mock. That's how it was for Jesus. It, and, but even that was revealing God, who he is. He was demonstrating true divinity, refusing to exploit his power, to hold on to it, or to use his supremacy to overthrow his world. Universal submission, as everyone by bowing to Christ, will ultimately come because God has exalted him and restored him to his glorious cosmic status not through violent overthrow, but through humble submission. The power of the cross was that Jesus, through submission, through servanthood, through taking a slave's place, became the means whereby Christ, the world is saved and he, Jesus, became exalted so that everyone comes under his authority. There. It's a demonstration of who God is. It says God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. This is the way God was acting to save humanity. Therefore, how can we act in any other way? How can we, be, how can we demand privileges? How can we demand people listen to us? Rather, how much do we serve those that we're in contact with? 
It speaks of a church as a new humanity that should never resort to the patterns of worldly power to change the world or retain control over it. Oh that, was, uh, oh, that this was so, so for the church since the days of Christ. So often the church has tried to claim power. We're seeing, we're seeing it today even in some parts of the world with what's called Christian nationalism. Somehow that we, we exert power rather than servanthood. And the church is constantly to follow the, the, the example of Christ in our relationships with one another and in our relationships with those outside that we are those that serve. And in becoming a human being, not just a man, he identifies with all humanity, Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free. This is the power of the cross. He died for all humanity. And as a result of that, God, it says, hyper exalted him. Jesus is not only the pre existent Son of God, like he always has been, but he's also the world's Messiah and Saviour. Christ is exalted from earthly servanthood into his rightful place as Lord over the whole cosmos in order that every person would submit to him. There's an evangelistic power to that. We take the gospel because all authority has been given to Jesus and we are to see every knee bow to him. It also is a, uh, is a terrifying picture of the judgment of those that will not bow the knee willingly to him, but will need to do so one day when Christ returns and judges the world. These are serious things. And so in that context, Paul exhorts the church regarding attitude. He's still holding back on directly addressing the issue causing the division in Philippi, but focuses on attitudes that underlie it, selfish ambition common problem in Roman culture and politics, which went for prestige, commended ambition and status, but this is named in scripture as a work of the flesh. Vain conceit, the glory of position, prestige, power and possessions, so prevalent in the church today. Selfish occupation with your own interests to the exclusion of serving others. Now, the spirit of the world has got into the church so much in this. We, 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 think, we, we think of us being entitled to things. Instead of saying, no, I'm not entitled to anything. All I'm here for is to serve you and to regard you as even better than myself. And Paul is joyful throughout the letter despite prison, but it will complete his joy if the Philippian church was united. What completes his joy is not released from prison, but that the leaders of this church and the whole of this church sort themselves out. And so the antidotes were humility, a word in that culture associated with weakness and, and therefore shameful. You know, now, because of the influence of the Christian church, we regard humble as a, quite a good thing, would you say? Well, you can talk to me, I know it's a big room. You know, we think of humble, yeah, humble's quite good. But in the culture in this was written, humble was a sign of weakness. And in the heart of human beings, although we acknowledge it as good, we can sometimes see it as weakness. Why should, I, why, why should I be humble to that person? Why should I take the first place in saying sorry? No, it was their fault. Paul is saying, no, no, you take a different attitude. The attitude which was in Christ Jesus, who was willing to serve and uh, willing to therefore take the lower place. Breaking down of all elitism and status. What gives you status in the world today? Could be your education, could be your wealth, could be your family background, could, you, could be 
the social class in which you're part of? What gives you status? Paul says, you count that as nothing. It doesn't count for compared with following Jesus. And you look at others as above yourselves. It's quite ironic, really, because the above word is used elsewhere in the, Bible, in the New Testament of talking about authorities or leadership. And it seems that Paul is ironically using that term and saying, you don't regard, you don't, you, you regard others, the ordinary people, the people that you would uh, perhaps look down upon naturally, you regard them as above yourselves. Do you do that? I'm not asking for an answer on that one. That was, was genuinely a rhetorical question, okay? And therefore, we're following the examples of Christ. So Paul says, live as citizens of heaven. The reference here was that Philippi, although it was a long way from Rome, was regarded as a Roman colony and therefore people had the same status as Rome that, uh, that they, were, they, were, they, were, they were like um, Roman citizens in Philippi. A lot of retired soldiers live in Philippi and they would be regarded as a little Rome, a demonstration of Rome in Greece. And Paul is saying, I want you to be a demonstration of heaven on earth with the attitudes that characterized the one who has now been hyper exalted, who was willing to serve, who was willing to die, who was willing to become a slave. Well, you know, it, this, all sorts of expressions we use, which I understand, but are not quite fitting with this scripture. So, you know, we say, oh, well, I don't want to be a doormat. I've got to stand for myself. I need some me time. You remember those words? Go on, talk to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've got to have some space for myself. Well, all those are appropriate in their place, but can very easily be a, uh, why should I serve? Why should I give myself? Why? Well, why should I look at others? Or, or we take that position in relation to argumentation. Let them apologize first. Paul is saying, no, no. You are the one that will be a servant or a slave to all. Not claiming your rights. Is this possible? Can Leaders and churches be like this? Are we free from pride and worldly status through career, education, family or class background? This is the power and example of the cross. Jesus was like that. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. He didn't come to exploit his position but to be a slave to all. Is that our attitude to one another in the church and in any leadership responsibility that we may have? Let's pray. Father, just thank you for this wonderful example, the power of the cross to be an example for how we should live our lives in relation to one another, in relation to the world, in serving the communities outside, in relation to our leadership role, everything else, Lord. Let us be those that genuinely and truly serve like Jesus did and don't claim status or position for whatever on whatever grounds, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.